great to be here with all of you. Um, Saul did challenge us to not lead with our own perspective, and yet in a room of 500 people, I'm, I'm up here sharing mine with you, but it is collaborative. These stories that you're going to hear today and tomorrow um, are a journey, okay? And they will give you powers. Different people will pick up different things, but I'm here to talk about a superpower, imagination, that we're all born with and all have opportunities to develop throughout our lifetimes collaboratively. But I'd like to start by taking a breath, if we all could just... Okay, I did that for myself because I'm the first of 32 storytellers, but thank you for joining me. Um, but I really am here today to advocate for taking a breath. Um, it sounds counterintuitive to say that we need to take a breath because the world is chaotic, the business landscape is chaotic, but I am here to advocate exactly for that. We need to slow down, not for the sake of stopping, not for the sake of giving up, but for the sake of thinking, focusing, using our imaginations, because the philosophy of moving fast and breaking things, I don't like some of the things that are getting broken, right? It's easy to move fast and break things. Toddlers do it every day, okay? What's harder is slowing down, using your imagination, clearly communicating, collaborating with people, having a purpose that you all understand, and building things. And that's really what I'm here today to talk to you about. So I'm from Science House um, in Manhattan. We are a strategic consultancy, but we're also what we call a cathedral of the imagination. I'm here with James Jorash, who co-directs it with me. He is um, an entrepreneur and an inventor extraordinaire. And at Science House, we work with many different companies across industries um, at the intersection of humanity and technology. A very strange intersection to be at at this point in human history. And I'm here today to talk to you about a couple of the things I've learned and hopefully share some things with you that you can apply to your own work, whatever that may be. So one thing that is very clear across industries is that leadership teams and companies in general would love nothing more than to just leap right out of the industrial era and just land right in the intelligence era with no training period in between, which is about as feasible as expecting the toddler we just described um, to take her first steps and then become a triathlete within a couple of months or even a few years. There is simply um, a lot of training that is required. So let's talk a little bit about the industrial era and the intelligence era and the implications of what those both are, okay? In the industrial era, our work products were very tangible and heavy and easy for our brains to understand, and sort of binary as well. Um, if you were producing cars, um, you show up in the morning, you punch in, uh, you take your place um, on the conveyor belt, and what is the mitigating factor of the work that is produced in that environment? how fast humans can put something together. And so people were educated to either be factory workers, managers, or some very small subset um, owners, okay? Um, so our educational system is set up perfectly to train us for factory life, standard issue humans who behave in a very predictable manner in a conveyor belt environment, okay? Thing about the industrial era is you knew you were at work. You punched in. Now, I'm not here to glamorize factory life, but when you punched out and went home, your boss couldn't call you on your cell phone and have you jump in and make a few more cars or looms or engines or whatever it is you were making at home. You were home, okay? It was a clear delineation. But the important thing to keep track of here is, one, easy for our brains to make sense of what we were producing, easy to understand what it was expected of us, even if it was hard, and 
a, a different sort of work environment, industrial. In the intelligence era, it's not so easy for us to understand the things that we're creating, is it? Data, insights from data, algorithms, you know, with a capital A, we're learning. Uh, machine learning, what is it? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, I call, I, I prefer to use the term applied imagination instead of AI. I don't believe intelligence is artificial. I think it's a, an extension of our own human creativity. That's a separate conversation, but it's important for this context. I looked at the landscape of all these leadership teams who wanted some magic fix to leap straight out of the industrial era and land in the intelligence era, and I noticed there was no transition period between them, so I invented one. And I call it the imagination age. Okay, so if you think about the imagination age, every place you are, there's a path from where you are to where you're going, okay, from A to B. And B, as you know, increasingly is becoming a moving target. You think you're headed over here, you end up over here, okay. But if you don't know where you're going, at least where you're trying to go, you'll end up somewhere, just not the right spot, right? So think about the journey in the imagination age from point A to point B. And now think about the industrial era and the intelligence era. So on this path, there are going to be some things that are tangible and heavy and easy for your brain to make sense of, okay? The problem with those things is they may be totally outdated, but you may love them because they are familiar and comfortable, so you cling to them. Also on this path from A to B, there are going to be nebulous elements, things that are complex, interdependent increasingly, right? Very hard for your brain to make sense of, so it's easy to push those things out of your mind and focus on what's comfortable and familiar. What we do in the imagination age is we try to assess and reprioritize these elements so that we don't cling to the familiar just because it's tangible and push away the nebulous just because it's unfamiliar. This requires a huge amount of energy. And guess what? Our brains, as marvelous as they are and as far as they've taken us, they are kind of lazy, right? They want to save energy. They don't want to think about something nebulous and complicated. So you have to work extra hard just to thrive in this period. And that's something we need to come to terms with. The same amount of energy that got us here isn't going to get us where we need to be. We have to work harder. But we can't work faster the way we did on a conveyor belt. We've reached the endurance of human speed. The only option we have now is to get smarter. And we can only do that together and in collaboration with our own creations. So our own hardware and our own software. We need to learn to collaborate differently, and that's where we're going to end up with this story. The main skill in the imagination age is applied imagination. So I think about it this way. Think about it as two polar extremes. On one hand, you have fantasizers, and on the other hand, you have followers, OK? The fantasizers are the idea people. I got an idea, right? They don't care if it's feasible or who's going to execute it or if you have the resources to make it real, and that's OK, right? We need that. On the exact opposite side, we have followers. Followers just want instructions. When they hear innovation, they're like, you go do that. Off you go. Come back with instructions, tell me what to do, and I'll do it, OK? Now, in between, we have a slider, and that slider is applied imagination. How do you come up with ideas in relation to problems that you want to solve? How do you know you're asking the right question when you sit down to solve a problem? Again, it requires us to stop, take a breath, and think, and work together, OK? So think of it like a vista, a beautiful landscape that you can't take in all at once. You put a couple of coins in the viewfinder, you look in it, and you focus on something. How do you know what to focus on? So in my own work, 
and in our work at Science House, I find myself more and more focusing on architecture. And this is because I work with teams that are, you know, creating software. And so in working more and more with software architects, um, I started really, and, and that's a, <laughs> I, could, I could give another talk on that subject, right? But software architects are um, really helping me understand architecture. And I look around Manhattan now, and I don't just see buildings. I, I know that every skyscraper has a base under it that is almost as tall as the building itself, which is kind of shocking, right? But it's true. And if you didn't take the time to architect that building correctly, those skyscrapers would be like dominoes, right, falling. But then I started realizing architecture applies to everything we do, OK? I'll give you an example from my own life. I've been working on a book for the past five years, and it has nothing to do with what I'm describing today. It's historical fiction based on a true story about a woman during the Renaissance. Well, I'm not thrilled to tell you I wrote four terrible drafts of this book. Um, it's true. Before I started thinking about the book itself as a work of architecture, and I stopped thinking of myself as a writer and started thinking of myself as an architect. Because the words are just how you make the architecture of the story visible. OK? So now think about your organizations and the companies that you work for, and any organization in your life. So one of the things we started doing at Science House was thinking about the architecture of business. You hear this term business architecture. It gets thrown around a lot. But very few people really understand what business architecture is. And very few companies have an actual blueprint of the architecture of the way their departments work with each other, what they expect from each other, what their focus is, what their mission is, what their output is. So we started mapping that. And I would urge you to do the same thing. You hear this phrase, we're going to break down the silos. Well, they're not actual <laughs> silos. You can't do it with a pickaxe. You do it with architecture. And, and then we started doing the same thing with meetings. We started looking at meetings and the way people meet. And I did not ever expect myself as a futurist and James as an inventor to land on something that sounds as pedestrian as meetings. But once we started realizing that the architecture of the way meetings were set up, the architecture happens by default because we put human politics before purpose. If we stopped doing that now, we would make so much more progress and save ourselves so much more time, right? It requires a level of candor and a level of architecture that we don't practice regularly. And I'll leave you in conclusion um, with a little bit of a glimpse of what I think our future in collaboration with machines could look like. So I recently started playing the cello. And by playing, I mean holding the bow. Um, it's, <laughs> it's true, because my teacher, who is really less of a teacher and more like a Yoda, um, came to see me last week and told me this story. So he began his career as a cellist um, with, a, with a master in the lineage of a master that I will call um, robot cello for the sake of this story. And he ended up studying in the lineage of a master that I will call um, soul cello. So robot cello. Um, came up at a time when he realized he could put a microphone on the cello during concert performances and that the microphone could do most of the work for him. Okay, So he developed a very mechanical playing style where everything was optimized to let the microphone do the work. Okay, So he holds the cello straight. He holds the bow straight. He, very little um, flair in the way he plays, very mechanical. Even his left hand, the hand that controls the strings, very robotic, OK? So Michael comes to me, and he's teaching me things like, I'm using his language here, how to turn my thumb into an omnidirectional machine, right? to open the drawbridge of my hand so that I can access the cosmic real estate in there. This is why we haven't actually started playing yet. It takes a long time to <laughs> access the cosmic real estate in your hand. I'm, I'm learning this now. But um, somehow it still hurts your shoulder. But <laughs> the soul cello, the person whose lineage he, he moved into, um, 
doesn't think like a robot, okay? When, when the soul celleth plays the cello, it's all relational, right? So when Michael teaches me to tune my cello, he doesn't want me to use an app, even though I, I do when he's not there. Um, the app shows me exactly how the A string sounds. Michael doesn't want that. He wants me to do it by ear, and he wants me to see how it sounds in relation to the D string and to the other strings, okay? Because it's about the relationships between the strings. The way soul cello's lineage taught him to hold the cello is not straight. You don't hold the bow straight. The cello is at an angle. The bow is at an angle, okay? And he told me, you, you approach it, and this is the phrase I want you to remember, you come at it from the most elegant angle, right? You come at it from the most elegant angle, and you hold that bow at an angle the way Michelangelo held his chisels to carve the David or the Pieta, to free the sound into the sonic landscape the way Michelangelo freed a figure from the block. Now, I really don't think I'm ever going to get that far with my cello studies, but I think the lesson here is more important than the cello, which is as we collaborate with our own creations, in this case, the cello, which is a marvel of engineering, art, science, and math, we could approach it in a very robotic way, and sometimes we will have to because we need to become more efficient. We need to run our societies better. We need better education, better health care. But other times, we ourselves become machines, omnidirectional machine to open the drawbridge of my hand, right? Because my body then becomes a series of springs that will allow my soul and my consciousness to come through. And in conclusion, I would urge you all to think about your own lives and your own work that way, that you are in collaboration with each other and also the things we create in the imagination age. So come at it from the most elegant angle and use your imagination. Thank you.